Our next guest is somebody that I think is familiar to all of us. So not much of an introduction needed here, but it's my pleasure to invite on stage the techno king of Tesla, the CEO of SpaceX, and the owner of the boring company, Neuralink and Twitter. Please join me in welcoming Elon Musk. Elon, it is really a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. It was funny, uh, history kind of repeats itself. The last time you spoke with us, my predecessor, Ted Craver, was in the role that I'm in now, and uh, he got to interview you, and so now we're kind of- you know, New Orleans. Re repeating history here. And I was uh, reminiscing with you, I think the last time I, we saw each other, SCE had just done a, a large uh, deal for yeah. storage at one of our substations, so you were kind enough to host me at SpaceX. A great conversation, but I have to admit it was pretty cool sitting on that mezzanine cafeteria looking down at the rocket fab, so thank you for that. Well, a lot has happened uh, at Tesla over the last few years, and uh, yep. you, you've gone from sure has. delivering 50,000 yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> 50, cars in 2015, more than 1.3 million cars last year. That's a whole lot of growth. And so you look back over these last eight years since we chatted with you last, there's faster or slower adoption than you expected? Any, any big surprises that you weren't expecting? Well, it's actually gone reasonably close to what I thought would happen, which is from that point, roughly a 50% year over year mm -hmm. compound annual growth, uh, which is a uh, compliment to the Tesla team. It's the fastest growing um, uh, large manufactured object uh, ever. With, I think the second is like the Model T um, back in the day. So about 100 years ago. So <clears throat> the, the Tesla team, I'm very proud to work with them. They've, they've executed incredibly well. Um, and we anticipate uh, something close to 50% you know, growth um, to continue. So uh, that is uh, very exciting. Um, and it means that uh, we should expect electrification of transport, especially passenger vehicles, um, you know, quite quite quickly, because it, the normal human uh, uh, instinct is to extrapolate on a linear basis. Um, but really, if you look at the curves, uh, electric vehicles are growing exponentially. So um, I think that's great news for those in the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of customers. Uh, uh, well, you have a lot of EV customers ready, and, and soon you'll have uh, many more. Um, you know, and, and uh, Forgive me for waxing on a little bit here, but the, uh, sometimes I've asked, well, when will um, EVs be uh, most of the cars? Um, the important thing to remember is that, that you've got two, two billion cars and trucks out there, so, um, and about 100 million of, uh, per year new, new vehicle production, which kind of makes sense. There's sort of a life of about 20 years before a vehicle finally goes to the scrapyard. Um, so, even if 100% if, um, of electric vehicles were, uh, our new vehicle production was, was electric today, it would still take 20 years to replace the fleet. So just important to, to bear that in mind. Um, percentage of new vehicle production versus, versus the total fleet. Um, but uh, I, I think we're, we're moving quickly to, to the point where, I know probably half of all new vehicles made will be uh, electric. Um, and I, I think that's, that's, like, that's likely to happen, I think, before the end of this decade. Um, but then there's still, you know, call it another 20 years beyond that before the, the fleet really uh, becomes majority EV. So. Yeah, and it's interesting <laughs> because as we've done the analysis for California, right, we have a, uh, an executive order that calls for all new vehicle sales being zero emission by 2035. Yeah. Uh, that's in line with the forecast that we've had in our own scenario analysis, that still puts us at about three quarters of passenger vehicles being electric in 2045 when the state gets to net zero. I mean, yes. That could be off by a little bit, but. It's, I mean, the, the, I think the, the, the larger point is that um, demand for electricity is going to be extremely high. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so I, th I, I you know, hope this is good news. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the, if you just do the rough, back the envelope uh, math, um, we need to roughly triple electricity um, to get to a fully electric economy. 
um, you know, roughly a, a third of power is electric, and then uh, you know, rough, these are very rough numbers. Roughly a third is, is spent in transportation um, of various kinds uh, with, with the fossil fuels or hydrocarbons, um, and then roughly a third is heating. Um, so <clears throat> um, even assuming the the sort of current economy, economic usage, electricity per capita being uh, constant, you're looking at roughly a tripling of electricity demand. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, so, so it's really gonna take a tremendous effort to address this demand. Um, this is a sort of, you know, I think a very, very good news for those producing electricity, uh, but, but also entails a tremendous amount of work ahead. Um, in new production capacity and, and production capacity that is as sustainable as possible. Well, I mean, it frankly requires a whole uh, you know, system to yeah. be ramping up. It's, you know, you, you are dealing with the storage side and the vehicle side mm -hmm. and the charging side, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Yeah. We have the wires, but, you know, we need, we need support from all across the economy. Right? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, really, it's really very much a joint effort. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very positive uh, future for of the producers and distributors of electricity um, really couldn't ask for a better, you know, a growing market that's going to grow in a, in a better way than this. Uh, but it is a tremendous amount of hard work, uh, as everyone here knows, uh, to actually uh, put that generation in place um, and then transport it to where it, where it gets used, uh, and then dealing with the, the, the peaks um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 then taking advantage of the valleys of power production. Um, I mean, that's really where, <clears throat> like the Tesla mega pack that, we, that mm -hmm. you're just alluding to, mm -hmm. um, is is actually incredibly helpful. Is in um, sort of peak shaving the grid, basically charging up when you have uh, excess power production, and then and then releasing it when you have um, insufficient power production, or you want to peak shave. It's the, the you know I really believe that stationary battery packs are absolutely the way to, the way to go, um, and. Um, it, it is actually the fastest growing portion of the entire Tesla business. So we're, um, so our vehicles are growing at 30% a year, but our uh, stationary storage is growing at two to 300% a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a big deal and can be re really helpful. Um, but it's, it, it's like, it, it's just a, obviously it's a battery at scale and it buffers electricity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you need electricity buffered, then uh, it's a good, Product. Well, and it, we'll, uh, we'll get back to uh, the electric vehicle side in a minute, but I remember when you and I spoke a number of years ago, <coughs> you already had that vision of global electrification. Yeah. Um, and I think you've positioned your company, right, with storage piece, with solar, so this integrated view of where the market is going and how Tesla fits into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well there's, I mean, there's fundamentally um, three, three pillars. Uh, to a sustainable energy future, um, what, you know, one is sustainable energy generation, which is uh, solar, wind, um, hydro. I'm actually, you know, a, a fan of, of nuclear. Of good, good old fission. Um, I think it's underrated. Um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, I mean, we could easily supply all of the world's electricity with fission, um, but people, I don't know, some, but sometimes the understanding of physics is not amazing, and so the Get scared of things they shouldn't be scared of. Um, so, um, so I'm very much pro. Anyway, it's basically it, any electricity where you could say, okay, this is not going to meaningfully change the chemistry of the climate notions, you know, the atmospheric notions. And so, um, anyway, so you've got sustainable electricity generation on one side, then you've got um, stationary batteries as the third pillar, second pillar, uh, which uh, is needed for any kind of intermittent uh, electricity production, and by its nature, uh, solar and wind are intermittent. Um, so batteries and solar and wind go together extremely well. Um, and uh, and then the third pillar is electric transport. Mm -hmm. So get all three of those pillars going, and we have a sustainable uh, future as, as long as the sun shines and the wind blows, which is going to be a long time. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think you know this idea of having a balance across these resources. You know, it takes a lot of tools in the toolbox. Let me get back to electric vehicles, though, because let, let to uh, go a couple levels deeper here. Sure. Um, we're talking some, you know, a few minutes ago. I think that was more on passenger vehicles. 
Uh, but let's talk a bit about, about bigger ones. So, you know, we're all excited to see the first Tesla semi trucks uh, on the road in California. Um, and that means a lot in terms of the viability of trucking systems uh, in the future. You also have the US EPA, you know, proposed vehicle standards that could accelerate the medium and heavy duty electrification. You have yeah. California doing its thing as well as a number of other states. Um, but ultimately, the vehicles need to be economical for fleet operators, yes. and particularly but, in Southern California, where we have all the, uh, the uh, traffic coming up from the ports, a lot of those truck operators are not big fleets, right? They're small mom and pop owners. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so how, how quickly are you thinking that freight movement really goes electric in and, and, and a way that's affordable so that you can really serve that mix of owners out there? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think I'd certainly encourage people to <clears throat> look at our semi-truck presentation um, because, in fact, the, one of the things we emphasize with an electric semi-truck is that it's, it's much more energy efficient than uh, a diesel truck, you know, so, um, and uh, I mean, you get things like regenerative braking. So, like, let's say you're, you know, going over a mountain range. Um, well, in a diesel truck, you actually don't capture that, uh, the energy of height or potential energy. Uh, you, you have to actually spend a lot of money on expensive brakes going down the other side mm -hmm. so you don't mm -hmm. uh, run out of control. So whereas a, an electric semi-truck um, is able to recapture the, the uh, energy, the, the gravitational potential energy, and, and actually when it goes down the other side, uh, does not overheat the brakes and in fact puts the energy back in the pack. Mm -hmm. So uh, things like that are incredibly helpful for um, the energy efficiency. Um, and then just generally if you look at the entire chain from electricity production, um, to, uh, to take into account the efficiency of the energy produced, the uh, energy loss during transmission, energy loss during ch charging, and then see how many miles were driven. You could take the same diesel that is used to um, uh, power a, uh, a, a truck, mm -hmm. use it and, and burn it for electricity, and still be at least uh, 50 to 100 percent better uh, that with an electric. Uh, semi truck than with um, and if you put that diesel directly in the truck. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank, that's in line. We, we were talking earlier well, in our board meeting about just the efficiency of the electric. <laughs> I know, it's, it's efficiency of electric technologies, right? Yes. So it's a big part of the uh, of the story here. Yeah, just fundamentally, um, combustion engines in in a, in a vehicle are constrained in mass and volume. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you 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 have to you're therefore limited in how much efficiency how much useful energy you can extract from a fuel when you have a, a very constrained mass and volume for a truck, um, whereas a, a power plant does not have the constraints of mass and volume. It can be heavier and, and bigger, obviously, um, and you can take the waste heat and run a, a steam turbine. Mm -hmm. So you can, you, your sort of Carnot efficiency right. of a power plant is dramatically greater than if it's burned in a mobile application like a vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, and even when taking into account uh, transmission losses and charging losses, they still don't account for the, the massive difference in efficiency of e even of um, hydrocarbon being burnt at a power plant versus being used in a car. Yeah, which sets up you know, thinking about, well, what's the transition there? And, but ultimately, though, we're looking at a future that's electric. So we're, we're all, we all agree on the efficiency of the, the trucks. Uh, let me state something that's plainly obvious. Bigger and more trucks, bigger and more batteries, right? So let's talk about the supply chain for batteries. And I want to say yeah. thank you because a number of the folks here uh, were able to get a tour of the Gigafactory uh, here in Austin. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I apologize. Yeah, I, didn't, sure. I didn't properly answer your question with respect to trucks because so, so semi trucks, because they do uh, use a large battery, mm -hmm. um, will be um, toward will be later than, than other vehicles um, because we need to have right. excess sufficient battery supply in order to um, have a battery that's you know maybe four or five times larger than it would be in a passenger car, um, have that be in, in, a, <clears throat> in, in a semi truck. That's the reason why we haven't gone to scale production of semi truck yet is because there, there just weren't enough batteries. Mm -hmm. um, now, as the battery problem is solved, uh, we will um, go to volume production with the semi truck, and I, I'm pretty sure Tesla will be first on this. Um, but we're expecting to reach volume production probably sometime um, next you know, end of next year is. You know, we're aiming for, and and it, it, again, it's not going to be overnight. All the trucks become electric because you you, you have to uh, reach a certain percent of new, of new semi trucks built, then replace the fleet. The fleet is you know at least ten years old. Um, 
in the semi truck case. And so, um, you know, but I think it probably gets to 50% of new semi trucks built within probably three or four years, maybe five years. Um, and then it's another 10, 15 years before you see most trucks be electric. So that's, I don't know, <clears throat> I mean, on, on, on your perspective, that's either really soon or far away. <laughs> or a little bit of both, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's, uh, that helps get a sense of the time scale here. I'll make a one level, di level deeper, though, and when you think about the actual underlying challenges in getting that battery scale, again, a gigafactory here, it's like a great advancement in terms of the manufacturing side. Yeah. But then how do you think about the supply chain behind that, the rare earth materials? Are you thinking about different chemistries over time uh, <clears throat> or other ways to make sure you're getting the supply of batteries you need for that kind of scale growth? Yeah, so the raw materials are not really an issue here, um, especially when you consider um, iron-based uh, um, cathodes. So we think probably the most of the batteries made will be um, with an iron cathode. Iron is extremely common. Mm -hmm. It's actually the most common element on Earth by mass is, is iron. Mm -hmm. um, second is oxygen. Everything else is in the remaining roughly 38%. Um, so we, we have more iron. That we we're basically a rusty, well, that's what Earth is. Uh, <laughs> iron oxide, Maybe iron, iron and oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> iron and oxygen and a little, some silicon and a few other things. Um, but it's, it's funny that Earth is, by mass, almost two-thirds uh, iron and oxygen. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're not going to run out of iron, that's for yeah. sure. Right. Um, and and uh, especially for stationary storage, where mass and volume are not that important, um, an iron-based uh, lithium-ion cell. So, so the thing about lithium-ion cells is like it's a lot of talk of lithium, but actually the lithium is like the salt on the salad. It's not the salad itself. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the costs tend to be predominate, and certainly the mass of the, the fact predominates in the cathode, which is a, it can be a metal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the higher energy uh, chemistries are, tend to be uh, nickel. Um, and then the lower, en lower energy density chemistry will be iron. Mm -hmm. So to use nickel for kind of long range stuff, uh, where, where mass and volume uh, really matter, and you'd use uh, iron where it's less important. Mm -hmm. So medium range cars, um, stationary storage, iron, long range cars and aircraft uh, would definitely be uh, nickel. Interesting. So. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about how we actually charge all those batteries. And uh, again, back in 2015, you, you described the need for fast charging to help long distance travel work. Um, even as most of the charging we think you know, ends up happening at home. So you built a supercharger network I think it's still the, yeah. the benchmark in terms of public EV charging out there. You've made some really big announcements recently. It's been you know, yeah. fun to watch with, uh, uh, with Ford and more recently with GM. Uh, just curious, you know, why are you opening up the network? You know, how, how do you see this creating competitive advantage in working with, uh, with others? Well, I don't know if it is a competitive advantage, um, but it might be actually competitive disadvantage. But the, 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 the purpose of Tesla from the beginning has been to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Um, and so, you know, we're, and I've been very clear with that. I, I, even when we went to IPO, I said, hey, look, some of the things we do may not be, you know, super profit maximizing, so don't invest if that's a problem. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I encourage people to sell their stock if that's a problem. Um, on the other hand, we'll make up for it with some epic products. So I think on balance, it'll be OK. Um, <clears throat> and um, we went public at, uh, I think, one point, well, roughly just over $1.5 billion. So it's improved since then. Um, <laughs> A bit, yeah. <laughs> you know, made some progress. Um, but you know, some of the things that maybe we could have done that were not totally profit optimizing, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we open sourced all of our patents, so anyone can use our patents, which is uh, pretty unusual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, and um, I mean, we mostly do the patents just to stop like patent trolls and people, people doing blocking actions. Mm -hmm. So we'll do a patent and then make it open so that there's 
Because like patents are like a minefield, you know, it's just like you don't want those, you just want a clear path to the future of sustainability. Um, and then, you know, as far as opening up our network, I, I actually don't even know if this is a, actually, you know, a good thing for Tesla or a bad thing. I mean, I think it's morally right, but it's, uh, whether it's financially smart remains to be seen. Um, but it, it was, uh, it you know, it was something that, that would help the rest of the industry go electric. So we opened it up, and, and so we don't want to use it as kind of a walled garden or competitive weapon. Um, it's if it's something that would help advance sustainable energy, it will do it. Let's say a powerful statement about the commitment to sustainability. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Elon, in doing, taking that step, might it also influence how you think about the evolution of your own charging network? So for example, I think some of the other charging networks might have higher uh, you know, voltages for, for fast charging. Is that something that you think would then lead you to migrate towards that, or do you think you're in the right sweet spot? Well, um, I, it depends on which cars we're talking about here. There's, there's a maximum rate at which you can charge a pack. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if you, once you exceed that rate, it's not it's not relevant to that particular vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our latest superchargers will do over 300 megawatts. Uh, uh, yeah, um, 300 kilowatts. I should say. <laughs> 300 megawatts. That'd be more <laughs> impressive. Uh, yeah, we, we, we had to go back to do some more planning. If it's yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a big, big uh, cable uh, or a very high voltage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We just crank it up to a million volts. Look, it's the same cable. <laughs> we'll start working on that. Right. <laughs> it's an electricity joke. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, if you, um, I mean, that I squared R heating is real, can really get you, but you just can't crank up the voltage. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at 350 kilowatts, I mean, you really are exceeding the rate at which. Um, Almost any battery can it can take like, can actually charge without damaging the battery. So um, I think we're we're be fine on that front. Um, our voltage for a long time has been roughly 400 volts um, plus minus 30, um, and with uh, the next generation we're we're doubling that to be uh, 800 volts. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, there's, there's, it's it's not it's not as big a gain as it may seem, but it's um, you know, it's uh, slightly better. Mm -hmm. So the, our, our superchargers will be able to operate at either 400 or 800 volts um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, continue to match to whatever the vehicle is that's uh, once you charge. Well, again, it's a really fascinating move, and it will be interesting to see how other OEMs, you know, approach the, the Ford and GM announcements. Yeah, like I said, we're, you know, really just trying to do the right thing here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's clear with... Uh, Jim Foley and Mary Barra, that you know, we, we will support uh, GM and Ford cars on equal footing, no mm -hmm. you know, special status for, for Tesla vehicles, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's got to be fair. Um, so, you know, that's our commitment. We'll stick to it. Sounds like it's in line with uh, making your patents open source, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, all of those chargers are going to drive the need for a lot of infrastructure on our side of the grid. Yes, I, I, actually, I, I can't emphasize enough. We need more electricity. <laughs> 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 However much electricity you think you need is more than that is needed. Yeah. I, I assure you, 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 if you're thinking, should I build this incremental production capacity of electricity? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely, so you, so you have a as fast as possible. <laughs> Amen, so you have a room full of folks here. Some of Folks are, you know, members of EEI, regulated utility uh, folks. There's suppliers here, vendors. You know, it's a whole community that's that's needed here to make this happen. We also need the support of government, right? And so it's been yeah. exciting to see the IRA funding. We're talking about this earlier today. IRA, IIJA, transformational for the U.S. Yeah. But we still need more help, right, in getting permitting and siting reform, for example, to, to get this deal in the ground. I feel I feel the same way. Yeah. Like it's it's man. I mean. We're, we're like practically making construction illegal in this country, um, <laughs> and especially in California. I mean, you know, no offense. Like I lived there for a long time, and I still, I still, I still spend a lot of time in California, yeah. FYI, and I, I'm still pro California. <laughs> Not easy sometimes, 
Um, Remember, I am, a, I am a Californian. Be nice. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, you, you, then you know what I'm talking about there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's being recorded. I mean, I mean uh, try getting a permit to read your kitchen in LA. I mean, it's uh, a friggin' ordeal. But, but, honestly, <laughs> but you know what? But Elon, that, that is, it, it, it is really something we're all dealing with across all states. It's federal permitting. It's state level. I know. It's, it's yeah. like we're, we're, we're just like, you know, Gulliver's Travels and each one of those Regulations by themselves maybe not so bad, but it's like a like yeah. you've got a thousand, ten thousand little strings, you know, holding the giant of America down. Frankly, from a regulatory standpoint. So that so that's one part that we need to solve, and I appreciate Tesla's engagement in policy space, you know, which, which you've done. Yeah. There's another part of this though, which is the collaboration between utilities and our customers, whether it's Tesla or somebody else. I was out in um, in Barstow, California recently, SE territory, um, and I was seeing the upgrades that our team was making yeah. to accommodate the large supercharger station. Because, you know, Barstow, for those of you who don't know, smack between the drive between uh, LA and Las Vegas, right? So popular spot for charging. Yeah, I've charged there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this one was going to open, uh, you know, right, right yeah. the following weekend or something. So some of these superchargers are like major power draw, oh, like yeah. serious. Right, right. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so it, they are, and that means we need good collaboration. One of the things that EEI has done is reach out to the customer community, whether it's charging companies, whether it's large fleet operators, to, to get that collaboration. But um, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, what more do we need to be doing to collaborate better with you and with the OEMs and, you know, with, sure. frankly, your charging competitors? Because we need everybody to get this ecosystem going. Well, I, I guess... Uh... Anything we can do to make things go faster would be would be great. Um, and um, it's obviously it's not all in your hands. There's there's um, a lot of permitting and, and whatnot that has to happen. Um, but but I, I really can't emphasize enough. We're we're at like I think a very exciting juncture for um, electricity providers, uh, which is that the demand for electricity is, is going to go is is going exponential, mm -hmm. um, and will like I said roughly roughly triple. Uh, from where it is today to get to a fully sustainable economy. Um, so, so, so I think I would just be cautious about extrapolating from the past because the future is not like the past. The, the, the future is, is a massive increase in electricity demand. And it's going to take everything that we've got to just keep up with it. Um, so I think speed, like just figuring out like, okay, how do we move faster? How do we have... Um, Faster deployment of electricity, and that's it, the whole. Everything matters from generation to transmission to the local substation, um, and um, and I understand there's like like quite a long lead time on like step down transformers. Um, so man, I hope Tesla doesn't have to make those too. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, look forward to it. We we need more of them. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. I mean, my 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 challenge to this the. The mega pack team is like, okay, guys, look, let's try to get it to where you just take the the, the big cables, mm -hmm. the power cables, and you just plug them in. You know, no substation. Uh -huh. You know, that'd be sweet. <laughs> you know, you just uh, just take the big metal wire and uh, clamp it down here, uh -huh. and um, you're done. Uh, what about it, have our engineers talk a little bit about that? I mean, it's it's, it's totally doable. Uh -huh. uh, you know, if you don't go too crazy on the uh -huh. voltage, it's totally doable. Um, you know, you do start having these like, you know, can't we'll have the wires too close together because of arcing limits and stuff. Um, but, um, but, but generally, like, uh, if they look at mega pack uh, deployments, uh, one of the limiting factors is the uh, substation equipment mm -hmm. uh, to do vol voltage step up. You know, um, and um, and so we're just looking at like, okay, how can we make? What are all the things that? Uh, slow us down to getting to a sustainable energy economy, and then we just tackle whatever appears to be the biggest issue. Um, and um, and I think, as, as we'll know, we also have the sort of consumer side uh, power wall, which is mm -hmm. obviously it's very tiny compared to the mega pack, um, but it's also uh, very can be very helpful in a neighborhood for for balancing power um, and offer having having the power walls operate collectively. Uh, to to um, smooth out the power in a neighborhood, which we've got working quite well in Australia at this point, mm -hmm. um, and I believe we've got some uh, test efforts in California as well. No, in fact, you, you, we do with SCE uh, virtual power plant efforts. Yeah. PG&E has some as well. That, that's a it's a good transition to where I wanted to go next, which is 
when you think about that interaction with the customer, right? you know, clearly we are inter interacting yeah. with the customer, you are as well. <clears throat> it can be through virtual power plants. Uh, I'll, I'll throw in bi-directional charging into the equation too, right? So you put all these things together, technologies enabling some different relationships with the customer. How, what, what's your vision for you know, how, how that evolves over the next few years? Well, I'd like to, I can't emphasize enough that um, we're, we're just gonna hit um, constraints on electricity production and, and uh, transmission um, on mass across the board. So that's why I'm like, I know obviously it takes time to um, plan for and permit and build um, a new power generation plant, but, but I, that's why I'm encouraging everyone to start now. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what your plans are for future electricity demand, but it's gonna be, I, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be much higher than what, what, what you currently think. Um, electricity demand is gonna be, well, I mean, necessarily must be three times what it is today in order for us to have a sustainable energy future. So that means power plants, transmission. Um, I mean, there's obviously some, some I think there's, not, there's, there's some, to some degree we can improve um, the, the power throughput of some of the lines by jacking up the voltage. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, may, may require separating cables a bit more, but um, and also need to step up, step down transformers. Um, well, the different cables too. So just we have an area here called the hub uh, with a number of companies that have different technologies. We had Bill Gates uh, join us yesterday, and you know, with a number of the companies uh, that Breakthrough uh, Energy Ventures is uh, supporting. One of those was a company that's making a you know cable that can carry a lot more uh, uh, you know, capacity, right? So I agree that all those technologies will be important. By the way, as we do the analysis for California-wide, yeah. um, we do see a future where California gets a net zero in 2045, um, and it's not f quite fully electrified. It's mostly electrified, yeah. right? But there's other, other tools in the toolbox. Well, and, that's at least, then, and that's at least a 60% increase in load, whereas load uh, has been flat for decades now. So it's coming, and we agree. Okay, so I, I, I like I think that's that's basically that's it will be much more load than that. It, it, may, it may be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by like a lot. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, like, yeah. Um, uh, we're doing uh, doing math I mean, in our head here. It's just everything's going to be electric, and I, I think the actually the average power usage per person is going to increase uh, a fair bit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, an interesting thing to consider is like the is um, t total power used by humans on average um, over time, you know. And you say like so you go from not that long ago when the best we could do was kind of make a campfire. Um, so you say, and I'm talking like electricity and, and thermal energy per per human um, was extremely tiny. Um, if you even go back 200 years, um, we we literally had to you know, burn wood or coal locally uh, to gain heat. Uh, there was no electricity, uh, you know, the, the, so the, the, and, and, and even if you take all of the, like all the steam engines and everything and divide that by total number of humans, um, power usage per human, uh, thermal, electrical, or otherwise, um, was minuscule 200 years ago, and even less uh, 300 years ago. Now it is uh, incredibly high. Um, and it is rising, um, and and this is, and, and you're going to see, I think, a lot of electricity usage by um, the sort of neural net uh, data centers as mm -hmm. well. Those mm -hmm. are heavy power draws. Um, so, um, in fact, I think one of the scaling constraints for AI is going to be power availability. Um, you know, they are quite power hungry. So you've got you've got um, basically uh, average energy usage uh, per person increasing dramatically, um, and a transition from uh, burning hydrocarbons to things that are more sustainable. Anyway, the point is, uh, is it's going to be three x uh, current, um, and I think that three x number is probably probably happens around twenty forty five ish. So this is the thing about exponential. Uh, growth is it, it really is counterintuitive and will you know actually ex exponentials are it, it tend to be kind of um, 
uh, sort of underestimated. Just mm -hmm. you know, it just um, there's a long tradition of that. It's cell phones, other technologies that yes. you know humans have not been able to see escalating. Uh, you know, th this brings up uh, a different question area around some of the other places where electrification is going to play a role. So you know, we spent a long time talking about cars, but you know, building electrification maybe another important uh, you know, tool to help reduce emissions over time. Um, you know, again, California different from other states, but we think that we're going to see something like a, you know, 30% of all buildings uh, needing heat pumps to get to the 2030 targets that the state has, 90% yeah. by 2045. Um, how, how much focus are you putting on the building side of electrification right now? And is that a place where you think Tesla might have? Uh, well, I mean, we have the power wall, which is, but that's, that's somewhat more of a- Supports it. Support. Yeah, that's like a, for, for homes, um, homes and small businesses with power wall. Um, we would certainly appreciate support from utilities uh, with bringing power walls online. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one, one of the you know, selling points of a power wall is to give um, uh, the homes like some amount of uh, protection against brownout, blackout type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes we, 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 we do get some uh, pushback from utilities about enabling a sort of uh, Cutoff switch because if you if you, don't, if you if you don't cut off power to the grid if you if the grid loses power then it's pointless you just end up say if you if you got if you got you end up pushing electricity you know back onto the grid and it's kind of pointless you, it doesn't doesn't work um, so we, we would appreciate some support in uh, approving and installing the backup switch which really just enables um, homeowners to have power if, if if for whatever reason there's there's the grid's down for some reason um, so. That, that would be most most appreciated. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll continue to engage in that. Also, from the utility side, want to make sure we're managing you know safety reliability issues. But yeah. you know, it's making sure we're understanding the technology and engaging with your team to to work through to the details. Yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, it's, it can be pretty helpful. And then, like I said, the the power walls, um, you know, operating collectively can help to stabilize the grid in in a particular neighborhood. Um, I, I do think like local uh, power generation, uh, you know, basically rooftop solar, um, and and uh, with an accompanying battery pack is is a helpful part of solving the uh, energy problem because there's a lot of neighborhoods where it's hard to get incremental power to that neighborhood because like, you need like more substations, you need more, you know, uh, overhead wires, and then you know, in, in a lot of places. That can be extremely difficult to achieve, um, you know, because just from opposition from people not wanting additional electricity wires overhead and, and not wanting to expand substations. So, so it's a, sort of a solution to this is where, this is where local solar and, and local storage helps uh, alleviate uh, some some very thorny uh, situations where you just can't. It's extremely difficult to get more power to that neighborhood. So a little bit of local power generation is, is pretty helpful. Well, in fact, when, when we do our, our analysis for California, we see the state needing to add something like 80 gigawatts of bulk power renewables and yeah. 30 gigawatts of bulk power storage. But we're also counting on 30 gigawatts of distributed renewables and, and 10 gigs of distributed uh, storage. So okay, great. We, we see, we need all the tools in the toolbox for, what, for what's coming ahead. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one other touch point you've had with our sector has been the work that you're doing um, here in uh, in Texas, where, as I understand it, you you announce an energy retail business uh, with a subscription program, right, that allows Powerwall sort of a, customers yeah. to, uh, I, th I think it's a $30 a monthly flat fee. Uh, yeah, for, I mean, we're, we're trying different experiments. Yeah. So um, we're just, we don't know what, what actually makes sense, but we're trying different experiments to see what what might work? Um, so yeah, for sure, trying to figure out like can power walls all working together uh, help uh, stabilize the grid, which they can. Mm -hmm. We've actually done that many times now, um, and um, and then of course our mega pack, which is, is great at the sort of um, utility or heavy industry level. Um, so uh, yeah, it seems you know we're just trying to like I said. Help foster a sustainable energy future, mm -hmm. and it's going to take many, 
different, many, many different technology solutions in different uh, arenas to, to solve this uh, kind of tripling of electricity demand and provision problem. Well, let me, um, let me shift topics a little bit. And you, you mentioned AI earlier in the context of being one of those drivers of yeah. electricity uh, uh, load uh, increases. But you've also been pretty outspoken about both the potential and the risks of AI. I think a number of us are moving really quickly right now with use cases and how we use it. I'll give you one example at, at Edison. Uh, last year, we did almost 200,000 asset inspections in high wildfire risk areas using drones. It's generating terabytes of data, you know, great ability to capture images all around. There's no way humans could process all those images, so we've been using an AI-enabled tool to down-select the images that we're going to look at. We're looking at other use cases right now, but, but we recognize there's risk too. So I love your thoughts about, you know, broadly across the industry, and then if you think about our sector, um, how should we be thinking about AI from your perspective and both the, uh, the opportunities and the risks there? Well, I mean, I've had many sleepless nights thinking about AI. Mm -hmm. So I am worried about AI on the downside. Mm -hmm. You know, AI is just this, it's sort of a technology like, like nuclear. Um, it's extremely powerful, um, but it could get out of hand. Um, and um, so I, I have been struggling with this question for a long time of what to do to mitigate, mitigate um, AI existential risk. Um, and I've been a, a big proponent actually of regulation, um, or at least some having some oversight by um, the government, uh, you know, acting as kind of a referee mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, AI companies don't go do super dangerous things um, and nobody's even watching them or that there's no, there's no sort of uh, agent of the public, which is really, you know, regulation when it's done, done right is they're, they're uh, trying to oversee the good of the public um, and make sure that companies don't kind of cut corners or break rules or do things that would endanger the public. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the origin of the FAA and NHTSA and um, the various regulatory org org organizations that exist. Um, and, and now those regulatory agencies only came into being um, after a lot of people died, you know, or a lot of things went wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, with AI, I don't think we can afford the luxury of like waiting until it goes wrong, you know. Um, <laughs> so right. I think we need to be preemptive uh, on this front. So um, I've had a number of conversations with uh, world leaders, um, you know, with, including, you know, very senior uh, people at, in China and uh, just around the world, Europe. I'm actually heading to Europe tomorrow to have some AI safety conversations uh, with, with some of the um, country leaders there. Um, is because I think I think this is the kind of thing where the world needs to work together uh, on, on AI safety. It's it's a really big deal. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. So. Uh, I was somewhat encouraged by uh, China's willingness to um, engage in AI regulation. Um, and I did point out that um, you know if you get some digital super intelligence, it might be in charge of China instead of you. <laughs> and I'm not sure you would like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that. That argument seemed to resonate. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, since you're bringing up China, you know, and you're you're very active there. You're also active uh, with government leaders. Um, a little off script here, but uh, as you think about U.S.-China relationship and how it helps navigate or hurts, you know, as we try to navigate, whether it's AI, whether it's actually competitiveness for your products, uh, both in the U.S. and in Chinese markets, uh, how are you? thinking about how that evolves and, and what's the end game here in terms of being able to work at both markets? I don't know what the end game is, but um, I can say the mid game is going to be spicy. <laughs> 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 yeah. Have you, 
um, <laughs> with your operations in China? Um, have you, you feel like you've enjoyed good support, and are you comfortable with uh, yeah. intellectual property? And, um, yeah, we're, we're, we've actually gotten very good support in China. Uh, Tesla has the only uh, fully foreign-owned car factory in China, mm -hmm. um, and we do very well in the domestic market in China. Um, yeah. And our, uh, you know, our Shanghai factory is our highest performing factory globally. So it's a it's a very impressive team that Tesla has in China, and mm -hmm. um, the work ethic there is incredible. Um, so you know, I think it's going to be an interesting yeah. future. Um, the, you know, we are entering a phase where the U.S. Will, will not be the biggest economy in the world. Um, and, and there's nobody alive today who can remember when the United States was not the biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a, it's going to be a little um, probably discomforting at first uh, to, to a lot of people to have uh, China be probably you know, two or three times the size of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. So it's already uh, higher than the industrial output, manufacturing output is already significantly higher than the U.S., uh, and that will increase. And they've had a significant investment focus in electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, China is actually, of any large com country, the most forward-leaning yeah. uh, with sustainable energy. Um, so they have massive solar projects, wind projects, and um, have done the most with respect to electric vehicles of any uh, large country. Of, of smaller countries, Norway is uh, the leader, but um, for any larger, very large economy, it's, uh, China is by far the most uh, forward-leaning for sustainability. Well, let me pull up from Tesla, and you do have a few other places where you spend your time. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, uh, again, I mentioned in introducing you, but SpaceX, Twitter, boring company, Neuralink, which is you know, really exciting. I saw you had some uh, approvals yeah. recently. They're offering free brain chipping as you leave the uh, <laughs> conference. <laughs> Can I suggest a few folks to go first? Uh, uh, Sit right here. You won't feel a thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, joking aside, um, <laughs> you're making a personal choice. To spend time across these, is there, is there a common thread in terms of mission across all of these, and uh, you know, and, and what what excites you most about your portfolio? Well, I mean, the the aspiration with these various things is to maximize the probability that the future is good for civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's um, you know, the future is just a set of probabilities. Like we don't know, you know, for sure what's going to happen, um, but to the degree we can shift the probabilities towards um, a positive future for civilization. I think we want to do that. Um, and to me, this is really just, you know, if, you, if you're sort of long-term thinker at all, it's this is uh, naturally what one should want to do because, you know, how can we really exist in the absence of civilization? I mean, you can see what it's like. Just watch, you know, Naked and Afraid. This is what, that's when you don't have civilization. <laughs> 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 it's a uh, civilization pretty great. Um, so um, I think we want to keep it going and um, you know and and uh, keep advancing civilization. So um, I think we, we can we should try to expand the scope and scale of consciousness such that we are better able to understand the universe and our place in it. Um, so I would call you know my philosophy a philosophy of curiosity. Um, and um, and while we will all die as individuals, civilization um, can continue in theory for a very very long time, billions of years or more. Uh, so we should uh, try to make sure that happens. Um, so the these various things that I'm doing are, are trying to shift the probability of the future being good. Now, I hope that's not, it. May turn out that some of these things, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, so hopefully. You know those good intentions do not translate to something bad, but I think the road to hell is, is mostly paved by bad intentions. Um, and uh, you know, once in a while, there's a good intention paving stone in there. Um, but the intent is to maximize probability the future is good for civilization. Um, so, with in, in the case of say Neuralink, it's like, well, how does that affect things? It's like, well, um, if if we are to link um, the sort of 
the path of the AI to uh, human world, then what are the, what, what, what could act to impair that, that linkage? And, and the, we're getting pretty esoteric here, but one of the issues is the bandwidth between your cortex and your computer or your AI, the AI extension, extension of yourself. Um, and if that bandwidth is too low, then the computer will simply be bored. It, we, we, you, you will, you know, as bandwidth gets very low, you, you effectively um, have a very thin straw between yourself and the AI extension of yourself. Now, now we are already cyborgs um, when you think about the fact that your phone and your computer are an extension of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and probably, you know, I think mean, most people, if you forget your phone somewhere, it's like having missing limb syndrome, yes. you know? And then you're like sort of patting your pockets, and it's like the phone is basically an extension of yourself. So starting with, you don't know anybody's phone number anymore. Yes. Right. Exactly. I, I had this like <laughs> nightmare, like where I was <laughs> stuck at a party and someone else had taken my phone, and 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 so I had their phone, but I couldn't use it. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they were like, "So, well, who, well, who should we call?" I'm like, "I don't know anyone's number." <laughs> <laughs> so Neuralink. So, so you, you don't even know who to call. Yeah. How, how do you? It's supposed to happen to. It must okay. happen a lot, you know. It's like you don't know anyone's number, and yeah. you have. They've got your phone, and you you, you can't call whatever an Uber or anything, yeah. um, and, and uh, you're just stuck. <laughs> so I like that that idea of increasing the bandwidth between the computer assistant and the brain, but apparently we also need a safety lock to make sure we don't lose the computer in the process. Elon, um, this has been terrific. And I hope that it's not uh, another eight years before we see you here. Appreciate all the efforts you have and frankly the, 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 the sentiment you provided around trying to improve humanity and recognizing that the collaboration that we have between our sector and your company um, is critical to helping humanity deal with climate. So, uh, thank you so much for doing, and please know we all stand ready to continue to partner to make this transition a real thing. Sounds good. Everybody, let's thank Elon very much. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much.